I'm Charu Bavari. I do have a talk. Okay, so that's my topic is the management of dialysis access, stenosis, and occlusion. That's the bane of our existence in dialysis access. Everyone has stenosis and occlusion. I'm not that important. Nobody pays me any money, except the hospital, of course. So we have the, uh, the importance of stenosis and occlusion is it's a big healthcare significance as far as cost, as far as admission, as far as you know, patient days in the hospital. Uh, I was going to talk about some of the prevalence of the problem. What is the pathology or pathophysiology that causes this? Uh, how do people present with this? What are the treatment options? And then we conclude. Uh, healthcare significance is about 14% of Americans are with CKD, which is about 20 to 30 million. Estimated about more than a million are on dialysis. It's a staggering number. And, uh, oh, sorry, treat ESRD, and then about half a million are on actual hemodialysis. Some are on PD, some are on other uh, exotic things. But the annual death rate is about 50,000, which is uh, a staggering amount from just one condition. The healthcare costs are also pretty high, and obviously they're going to keep on going. The inpatient uh, is a significant chunk, the outpatient is a small chunk, and then the rest is all, you know, if you look at the bottom of this, can I move this? Oh, yeah. I can move this. So, you know, from 2003 to 13, that's the latest we have, is obviously it's increasing year by year. So it's a problem that's never going to go down. It's only going to go up, I think. The <clears throat> prevalence rates of access types, um, AV graphs are now you know, on the decline because of you know, people having it taken in stance about not creating them too, of not creating too many, because they're easy to create, very hard to maintain. And then there is a big push towards the fistula first initiative, and you can see that the trend is in a positive direction, so more fistulas than, than graphs. Um, <clears throat> it, the hypertension diabetes count about 70% of all ESRDs, um, the access maintenance is a very common cause of hospitalization. Usually all our access procedures are all outpatient. They come in, you get the procedure, and you go home, typically. But the problems with access are all what brings them back again and again with repeated hospitalization. The leading cause of morbidity, not mortality, but morbidity in these people is the placement and complication of hemodialysis access. It could be catheters, could be grafts, and then fistulas come a little low down the, down the spectrum. So we have to know why this happens, we have to know how they present, and then we have to know the dysfunction that happens in hemodialysis. hemodialysis. The, there is a high flow rate or high shear stress in the area of the anastomosis, and that's just because it's going to happen. We've created a right angle or a 60 degree angle between two vessels or a vessel and a graft, and that turbulence is going to cause a problem. The outflow, especially for a graft, is going to be turbulent going into a vein, and, sec and the thirdly, the vein actually is not used to seeing that much flow. And we create that flow in the vein, but the vein is not used to seeing that. So therefore, these veins cause intrinsic scar tissue, neo-intimal hyperplasia, and that's how these things, you know, stenose. Uh, central venous instrumentation, and especially the subclavian vein and the internal jugular vein, these are the veins that get uh, obstructed and stenosed uh, after multiple catheter use. Again, the same thing, the body is not used to seeing a foreign body inside the vein. So the vein starts creating scar tissue around it. Um, multiple damaged, multiple needle sticks. So three times a week, uh, f um, you get stuck in two places all your life, or most of your life. And that's a pretty significant damage. If you actually br pull out a graft, which is, you pull out, explant a graft that is clean, not doing for infection, but you pull it out, and you see those grafts have tens of hundreds of, need of holes in them. And those grafts don't heal, of course. The skin over the, over the graft heals. So you'll see these grafts are also, they break down, and the damage to the graft causes pseudoaneurysms and aneurysms, as uh, Murray Stock said. Intimal hyperplasia is, as you can see on the screen, it's neo-intimal <coughs> growth inside the vessel or at the vessel and the graft anastomosis that causes narrowing. And they present, uh, patients of this, of, of these access stenosis problems, there are some, most of them are asymptomatic. And that's one thing is these, mm, the strip mall dialysis access centers or <clears throat> vein centers that come up, they bring in patients just to check them, which is actually not required. So patients who are asymptomatic, don't touch them for a good reason. Increased pulsatility or increased pulsatile flow in the fistula or the graft, that's one sign that you have an obstruction or a stenosis downstream or rather upstream, more central. 
uh, dilated veins around the shoulder or chest area. Uh, you have a pseudo aneurysm that is getting bigger and bigger as the days go by, which is something you should not ignore or tell the patient not to ignore. The patient starts getting more and more swelling or edema of the arm. Face and neck swelling, they get up in the morning, the eyes are shut as the day goes by, then they get better. Uh, cosmetically also, pretty bad. And then the classic one is, you know, bleeding from puncture sites. Is the needle goes in, needle comes out, and they take a long time to clot. And that's the presenting complaint is, you know, I, this didn't take so much time before. One important thing is make sure that their INR is not 12, and, uh, you know, they have no, no, no other, uh, uh, you know, hypocoagulable state that's causing this. Because that, that could obviously offset this symptom. Um, elevated venous pressures on dialysis, this is not something you would be told, but usually it comes from the nephrologist. The nephrologist hears this first, is, you know, they're getting higher pressures of more than that number, 120, or they have increasing pressure at the flow rate, so that means that they have some obstruction upstream. Um, poor circulation, so if you recirculate in that fistula, it means the blood goes in and doesn't go out well, so the second needle actually is just pulling off whatever is circulating back, and that's why the recirculation happens there. Uh, decreased flow rates in the fistula, decreased flow rates in the graph. Um, these are the reasons that would clue us into why this is fun not functioning. Um, critically important to know the anatomy of the conduit, and so the problem with ac access patients is they sometimes go doctor shopping, is they go to somebody and then they're not happy and they, they, because the Norco hasn't been refilled, so they go to somebody else and then eventually they move out of town or they're not happy with the doctor, so they go to somebody, a third person. So a lot of people come with um, a history of accesses, but we should know the anatomy before we get into it. Uh, understand the conduit, fistula versus grafts, understand failure modes, and that guides the treatment plan. Now I won't go into this, these are things that you know, have been talked about previously. There are multiple configurations of access that we can do. Uh, it's nice to split this into where this is failing. So is it the inflow, that is the artery feeding this? Is it the anastomosis, the arterial anastomosis? Is it the conduit? Or is it the venous anastomosis for a graft? Or is it the venous outflow for both grafts and fistulas more central? Uh, the thing to remember is, it's a staggering number is the problem with the venous anastomosis. So almost, I mean more than half, the patients will have a problem with the venous anastomosis. Keep that in mind. That is the most common thing. The long segment venous stenosis can be a problem. There's obviously central venous stenosis and occlusion could be. Uh, the arterial anastomosis, not a huge problem, but always look for it. When you do a thrombectomy, you know, if you don't have like blood gushing onto your face or your assistant's face, then yes, then there may be a problem with the arterial part. So make sure you look for that. Um, <coughs> This is interesting, so AV fistulas at the wrist, like a radial cephalic fistula, the problems are more often than not juxta-anastomotic, near the arterial anastomosis, and then parts in the vein, which is about 18 to 20 percent, and that's where, because of, that's where you've got stuck multiple times. At the elbow, with the brachial cephalic fistula, the problems are usually at the outflow, and the cephalic arch obviously is the bane of our existence, but that's the, that's the one thing to just look, look for or keep in mind. For the grafts, which is going outside the screen, which is the usually the venous anastomosis, like I said, more than half the time. Uh, central veins, uh, it's usually about uh, where the subclavian and the uh, jugular vein join together into the brachiocephalic vein. That's typically where you find most of these problems. Some people can get SVC stenosis, some people could get, you know, the entire axillary vein is kind of trashed, um, but more often than not, this is the site. Um, always have uh, the, the access treatment for stenosis should have a plan. So you create the access, you maintain the access, you can revise and replace, leave the access alone and move on to something new. But that, like Murray said, you have to have an algorithm or a protocol in your mind. The mul multiple options that we can do, we can do PTAs, bare metal stents, covered stents, cutting balloons, thrombectomy, thrombolysis, yada, yada, yada. So you all know this. Uh, that the way to do, the way to repair the venous outflow problem is you can do a patch angioplasty repair, which I've done one in my five years in practice now, which is cumbersome, but sometimes you gotta do it. If you have a huge vein, you don't want to put something along that, yes, a, a good patch angioplasty probably will keep that access working for a while. Anastomotic advancement is you move the anastomosis to, the, to a more proximal vein, bigger, juicier axillary vein up here, that could be an option. 
Venous turndown is one option for cephalic arch stenosis, where the cephalic arch meets cephalic vein meets the axillary vein. And tight stenosis there, which has been intervened multiple times. The cephalic vein is huge, and the axillary vein is pretty big. Just turn down the cephalic vein at the upper part of the arm. And that can actually give a nice um, durable outcome. Arterial anastomosis, usually, almost always, people just balloon it. But if you have a lot of intimal hyperplasia, if this is uh, a failing multiple, if it's failing multiple times, then yes, consider patch angioplasty or just move it up or proximalize it to a bigger artery upstream. Uh, an interposition graft is pretty easy to do. Um, so multiple trials have shown that there's no advantage to use primary stenting as opposed to balloon angioplasty. So the, the push is don't stent everything. Unfortunately, that's what happens. In the access center, they stent everything. And, uh, but the, this is one thing we should not do, I think, I hope. So stenting is used only when there is sub and suboptimal result of angioplasty. So you can actually balloon something two, three, four times if you want. And then if it doesn't work, then, then consider stenting. Because have a high threshold for stenting someone. Because then you burn that bridge. Then you can never come back there again. <clears throat> um, so like I said, transluminal angioplasty is, you know, live to fight another day. Or sometimes it's just fight today and live another day. Uh, bare metal stents, you have, if you have severe residual stenosis, yes. You know, consider stenting, or if you have early stenosis after repeated angioplasty, consider stenting. Covered stent is if you have a rupture, if you have a perforation of the valve of the vein, or if you have an, if you have a place where you know you it's so tight and then you have a, a good segment of the vein proximal, uh, consider a covered stent in those, the, those areas. A cutting balloon, I don't know, I've not used much of cutting balloons, but mainly in fistulas, I think would be an option. Uh, cephalic vein, so cephalic arch. Or this is a different example. This is a cephalic vein at the forearm, and this is a failing cephalic fistula after uh, there's a coil. You see this coil. I'm sure this is an access center coil somewhere on one of the branches. So this is still a failing fistula, and then uh, just primary balloon angioplasty that keeps it going. But remember, when you do this, this is going to go down, hopefully, not hopefully, but maybe in the next few months, right? So plan for the next step. Always think ahead. What's going to be? What am I going to do after this fails again? Always have that in the mind, at the back of your mind. Not just for fistulas, actually. Any work that we do on any vessel, to be honest. Uh, a graft, um, uh, angioplasty of the graft of the, and the anastomosis. So you see that the outflow is pretty tight. You have all these uh, uh, staples from the previous repair. You can angioplasty that. Uh, PTA of cephalic arch, like I said, PTA only. Please don't stand this. Big reason is once you stand this, this can jail the axillary vein, and then the outflow to the arm gets compromised. And then you're in big trouble, because then it's very hard to cross that. Uh, subclavian vein and innominate vein, or brachycephalic vein stenosis, is this is where the first rib is, and the sub subclavian vein goes over that. There is a component of thoracic outlet syndrome, we feel. So we've also considered in these patients to either take the clavicle out or take the first rib out, just like venous thoracic outlet syndrome. Uh, the venous anastomosis, PTA, and stenting is, you know, well known and seen too many times. Covered stents, there is a buffet that you can use. Everyone has their own. Um, and then the third option is the hero graft, like, like Linda was saying. This is a fully subcutaneous solution. It is part graft, part catheter. It can be done two ways. One is if you cross central venous occlusion or stenosis and then you put a catheter, you can swap it out to a hero. Or if you have a fistula or a graft that's failing, like in this one here, so this is, an, this, is a, this is a catheter that's going through the central vein across all this junk into the heart, and then you connect it to the graft component. But, but it can also be used to salvage fistula. So a cephalic vein fistula, which has a lot of cephalic arch problem, but more importantly, the axillary vein is also a disease going into the subclavian. That's where you can use a short PTFE segment and use a hero graft and keep this long venous segment still intact. Uh, the he, the um, graft can also be salvaged in the same way. Uh, thrombos, AV grafts and fistula, you can use a lot of things, you know, cleaners, macerators, compressors, sweepers, so big housekeeping uh, thing, but um, you can do all sorts of stuff like angioplasty, thrombolysis, you can use angiojet, uh, mechanical thrombectomy, etc. In summary, so do we look for them? No, you shouldn't go seeking for problems. If they come with the problem, treat it. When to treat them? Only when they're symptomatic or they have very high hemodynamic dysfunctions. And then how to treat them is angioplasty, then do an angioplasty, 
then do an angioplasty, and then stent. Don't stent them primarily. Uh, covered versus bare metal selectively. Usually the basilic vein turned down is where a uncovered stent has been shown in trials to be ben of benefit. And then graft versus venous anastomosis, the covered stent has been shown to have a little more benefit. Uh, open surgery, of course, use a knife. It's possible. It's a sharp thing that cuts the skin, and then you can use a needle and a, and a, and a thread to sew things up. So consider that when all these things fail. And that's a joke on Dr. Lou. He's one of our favorite fellows here. Well, not anymore. Anyway, uh, it increases quality of life, and it's all good. It's nice and happy. Okay, thank you. Questions? Yes, sir. So now so was, they've come out with prelim, preliminary data about drug, drug loading balloons in dialysis access. I, I still think we need to see long-term data to find out exactly what's the benefit. There may be a benefit, but um, the problem with uh, venous anastomosis and dialysis access is it's pretty solid that when it happens. It's not, uh, it's not minimal. So the proliferation is very, the, very fast. It's not as, not as slow as an arterial anastomosis.